Hello, my name's Catherine Tackley and today I want to talk a little bit about James Reese Europe's career before he went into the army and that remarkable coincidence um, that occurred in terms of him being able to combine his musical work with the circumstances of the First World War, which provided those opportunities for his music and musicians um, to move around the world and to have that impact in particular on the development of popular music and jazz uh, within France. But when we look at his quite remarkable career, in fact, before he joined the army, this can help us begin to think about how jazz developed and how it took that particular place that it's held in the modern world over the past century or so. So the story about the birth of jazz in the southern states of America, its migration north and thence across to the world, is um, perhaps a familiar one, but an element that's perhaps been lacking uh, in the coverage of this story to date is the role of the theatre in providing opportunities for black music and black musicians to develop, um, for black musicians to develop their skills and also for them to find new ways of writing, which very much made the transition between pre-jazz styles, um, such as ragtime and um, later to, to jazz. The theatre also established important transatlantic um, routes and networks of artistic exchange, which when we're thinking about jazz as a global music was extremely important as well. And of course the music that resulted from musical theatre from the early 20th century right through um, up until um, the, the 1940s and 50s um, really provided the bedrock of jazz alongside lots of other sources um, such, as, such as black music and music derived from other, uh, other traditions in the world. On the negative side, the success that um, was achieved by black musicians through their involvement in theatre and in musical theatre in particular was not without continuing to reinforce aspects of problematic stereotypes. And often this was even unintentional. Um, there was a real shift in the way that um, black musical theatre sought to deliver um, more positive and perhaps more realistic messages about African-American culture, but this wasn't always received in that way by uh, the white audiences um, that, that, that they played to. And so discrimination, racial discrimination, um, persisted uh, through this period and of course beyond. So in this period, very fertile and, and rich and in many ways complicated period leading up to World War I, the work of African musicians and entertainers blossomed and, th and flourished, but was often defined and to in many extents limited by their race. And this, of course, goes right back to the legacy um, the, of, of minstrelsy, which continued to affect um, what was presented on stage and how it was received. Minstrelsy relied on exaggerated portrayals of African-American culture, often based within um, plantation settings. And this was a global product. It was part of popular culture, um, certainly in Europe as well as in America. And so to break away from this and to begin to rework the way in which black performers were presented on stage, themes of empowerment and racial pride um, became very important, although they weren't always recognised by audiences. And it was in this environment then that James Reese Europe began his career. It was a very important and dynamic world of black musical theatre at this time. And he set out as a composer of songs from around 1904 and then developed his involvement um, to the extent that he was um, often, in, in several instances, sole composer of the music for particular shows and also acted as musical director for, for many successful productions and tours. And in this way, he rapidly became the centre of this group of black performers um, around musical theatre at this time, very much, uh, which was very much in its heyday um, towards the end of the first decade of the 20th century. So the way in which Europe was able to establish himself not only as uh, an artistic player, but also in many ways as a leader, as, as an organiser, gives us a sense of his abilities, which extended beyond the musical, um, were to place him in the front rank in terms of his role in civilian uh, life and also then later in the military. And therefore it's no great surprise having heard a little bit and understood a little bit about his character 
um, and, and his ability, that it was under James Rhys Europe's leadership and then presidency that the organisation called the Clef Club was established and flourished in New York um, around this time. This was a time then when black musicians were excluded from membership of the local New York branch of the American Federation of Musicians. And although there were societies for professional societies for African Americans that were involved in theatrical and sort of classical music work, the Clef Club was the first to cater specifically for popular musicians. The Clef Club then provided a trade union, offered practical help for musicians to find work, and also acted as a benevolent association when they fell on hard times. But it also had an artistic role in cementing that group of musicians together and encouraging them to develop, um, develop uh, artistically. And again, James Rees Europe was at the forefront of this. He established an 100-strong Clef Club Orchestra that gave several concerts, including at New York's famous Carnegie Hall, very much regarded as a sort of seat of classical music. And the implications of this were not lost on contemporary commentators. It was an important event socially as well as musically. Lester Walton then wrote in the New York Age, referring to the first Carnegie Hall concert. The concert was unique in many respects. Some of the leading white citizens sat in evening dress next to some of our highly respectable coloured citizens who were also in evening clothes. No colour line was drawn in any part of the house, both white and coloured occupying boxes. Yet no calamity occurred because the coloured citizens were not segregated in certain parts of the house, as some other theatre managers think it necessary to do, despite laws forbidding discrimination. The Clef Club then was an extremely important organisation, anticipating in many ways the later importance of collectives in jazz and popular music, including those that were spe specifically representative of African American musicians and also had a political as well as an artistic role, most notably perhaps the Association for the Advancement of Coloured Music founded in Chicago in the 19, 1960s. So the development of the Clef Club then accompanied this rise in popularity for black entertainers, which increasingly began to extend to venues and situations outside the theatre. And next time, I'll talk about the further development of Europe's pre-war career as a dance band leader. <laughs>